There are things that science gets wrong all the time. That's the beauty of science. So when it comes to living longer, sometimes it can hurt pretty bad when we say, well, hey, that's something that science got wrong. We need to course correct that. So we've got five things that science got wrong when it comes down to longevity. And this doesn't mean that these are completely bogus things. It just means that as we've learned more, we've realized, hmm, these things we were focused on so much before, they're less important because now we've learned that this is more important. Let's focus on the positive really quick. The things that do matter, resistance training, cardiovascular exercise, protein intake, antioxidant rich vegetables, reducing processed food, getting sunlight, getting sleep, healthy relationships. That's where the research is now. Yeah, kind of boring, but that's where the research is. So let's get into the fun, dramatic stuff. The number one thing that science got wrong and is continuing to evolve from is that genetics are the biggest factor for your longevity. Genetics actually don't play much at all anymore. In fact, there was a study that was published in Human Genetics and it summarized it very nicely. I'm gonna read it to you. Human family studies have indicated that a modest amount of the overall variation in adult lifespan, approximately 20 to 30%, is accounted for by genetic factors. So as of the time of that study being published, genetics only mattered for about 20 to 30% of the total equation of how long someone would live. What's even more interesting is that the more we learn about how important lifestyle is, the more we learn how less important genetics are. So we're learning more and more about the importance of these lifestyle factors, and it's only shrinking the number of importance with genetics. So it started at say 30% importance, then 25, then 20. Next thing you know, we're like, shoot, maybe genetics only account for like 15% of the total equation, maybe 10% because we're learning more about the different lifestyle factors and how they influence it. This next thing is going to be the best news that you've probably heard all day when it comes down to longevity. And that's the fact that we used to think that when you got older, it would be really hard to course correct. So we would just medicate and hope for the best and just increase your, your health span, your quality of life. Now we realize that it's not too late to change, whether it's bad habits or even exercise. So there was a study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine that looked at smoking specifically, looked at 201,000 people. Check this out. Okay, so they had people that never smoked before, and then they took people that quit smoking between 25 and 34 years old, between 35 and 44 years old, and between 45 and 54 years old. What they found is that there wasn't that much difference in terms of how many years they added to life based on when they quit smoking. Like if they quit smoking between 25 and 34, they would save 10 years on their life. 35 to 44, it was like nine years. 45 to 54, it was like six years. So yes, it shrunk, but it proved that, well, wait a minute, just the cessation of smoking at any age has a huge benefit on life expectancy. But it gets even cooler when you look at the literature suggesting this with physical activity. We used to think that if you never really exercised when you were younger, and you started exercising when you were older, it was good, but it wasn't that beneficial. Well, when you look at the literature with daily physical activity energy expenditure, you find that what matters most is how much you have improved from your baseline activity. So if you've never really been active and then all of a sudden you start increasing your activity, that's what matters. It's about how much you change from your standard baseline. What they found in actual numbers is about one kilojoule per kilogram per day per year led to a 24% reduction in all-cause mortality. That is about going from like zero exercise to 150 minutes of exercise per week over the course of five years, right? So if you didn't exercise at all right now, would you think it's reasonable in five years to get to a point where you could be exercising 150 minutes a week, right? That's like, what, 20, 30 minutes a day? Something like that? Is that reasonable? Because that alone, just going from that to that, is a 24% reduction in all-cause mortality. The changes make everything. And what's even wilder is if you get down the rabbit hole of microbiome research, because the microbiome research is even more crazy that shows that when you make a change to the microbiome, or you make a lifestyle change in general, and it changes your microbiome, everything starts to change. So the big radical shifts that we make 
are much more impactful at any age than we used to give them credit for. That is one of the reasons why I typically say when someone makes a lifestyle change, they change their diet, they change their exercise habits, they change some major thing in their life, it's a good time to start changing your diet or change your microbiome as much as you can too because it helps influence those changes from sort of the inside out. That's a theory that I've had for a long time and it seems to work for me and a lot of other people. One of the ways you can do that is with a probiotic, which I put a link for down below. Full disclaimer, they're a sponsor on this channel. They have been, they help keep content going on this channel, but that is a 25% off discount link for Seed, which is the daily symbiotic that I would use. So Seed uses a dual capsule technology, so a capsule inside of a capsule. So with that, you'll see that like literally you break open the capsule, there's a little capsule inside. That's so you're getting a potentially a multi-stage delivery. So you're getting a prebiotic and a probiotic that's kind of delivering at different stages in the intestinal system. So very interesting technology. They're also doing a lot of microbiome research in the world of longevity, in the world of body composition. Big game changer. I'm not a huge fan of probiotics most of the time because they're usually very underdosed and ineffective. This company actually puts their money where their mouth is. So that link again is down below 25% off your first order with Seed. So again, top line of the description underneath this video. Number three, resveratrol. Do you remember when that was like all the rage? I'm just gonna come right out and talk about a study that was published in JAMA, J-A-M-A. Took a look at 783 participants, okay? And it chronicled sort of their mortality, their death. I think over 200 of them had died during the study, which is what they wanted to look at. And then they divided their resveratrol intake into four quartiles, those that consumed the most through supplementation, diet, et cetera, and those that consumed the least. Literally no difference between any amount of resveratrol, whether it was supplemental, through wine, or whatever, had no impact. It did not affect their mortality. They were all grouped together, it didn't matter. The other thing is that resveratrol intake did not impact their inflammatory scores, their CRP, their IL-6, which is what it's supposed to do. But what about all the research on resveratrol? Look, there's benefits to resveratrol, but to say that it's gonna add years to your life is very overstated. That's, that's too much, right? Sure, we kind of see it in rodent models, but this is a prime example of why rodent models can be exciting, and a lot of times they do lead to very promising things, and we should look at them, especially if they come without risk, but also we need to wait for human models to really understand if something is proven or not. Number four, a big one that longevity science got wrong, and one that when I was a kid, this was like the thing, especially growing up in Sonoma, where this was like just a thing. In Sonoma, everyone drank their wine because they were like, ah, oh, alcohol is gonna make me live longer. So there would be these studies that show a U-shaped curve where a little bit of alcohol would help people live longer. So people would lean into that. Here's the problem with those studies. A lot of them were reverse causality. What would happen is people would quit drinking alcohol at some point in their life, maybe after they already had health problems, and they would be grouped into a category of non-drinker. And then they would live a short life because they've been drinking all their life and then they quit, but they were in a non-drinker category because it was self-select. And, huh, it would skew the data big time. The other thing is that occasional drinkers, people that literally might drink once or twice a year, commonly get grouped into the light drinking group or the moderate drinking group. When in reality, I wouldn't even consider them a drinker. Like if you're having a drink a year at your daughter's wedding or something, that, that doesn't, shouldn't count, right? So you can see how that can skew data in different ways. That can make people look like, oh, a moderate drinker is living to be 95 years old, when in reality, they had like six drinks in their entire life. So insert the new data. JAMA, 2023, 107 studies, 4.8 million people. Okay, what it discovered, is that 25 grams of ethanol per day, which is about a drink or two, had no positive impact on life expectancy. Did not decrease all-cause mortality, not one iota. And as a matter of fact, 25 grams and up actually had a significantly negative impact on all-cause mortality. So one drink per day definitely didn't improve lifespan, and drinking more than that had a huge impact negatively. So here we are with campaigns against smoking, and here we are against campaigns against all kinds of foods, yet alcohol, we're living in the Stone Age where we're still citing research from 1970 saying that Ron Burgundy can have his glass of scotch and it's gonna help him live to be 130. 
It's just not reality. Number five is one that comes out of a study published in Nutrients. And it was a very interesting study. And I'm not gonna talk a lot about the study because I just wanna talk about the general theme here. Caloric restriction is important, but what this study ultimately had highlighted was when it looked at monkey data, it found that what really mattered was caloric restriction if the diet was bad. If the diet was good and whole food based, caloric restriction didn't necessarily improve lifespan. The bottom line though, is you and I, we're probably not living like organic monkeys eating whole foods. We're eating processed food now and then. We're not eating the best diets compared to what we could be doing. So caloric restriction does matter for us. Now that's why I tout it as a good way to improve longevity because the literature is strong there. But let's also not deny the fact that if you can live close to the earth and live a very wholesome diet where or life and diet where you're eating like meat and fruit and things that come from the earth without processed garbage, well, in that case, calories may not matter as much because your body would have the ability to self-govern. You'd stop eating when you'd stop eating and you would never really feel like you're in a surplus or a deficit. You're just eating to live. So I'll leave you with that to remember that at the end of the day, the lifestyle and the diet is a significantly bigger piece than a lot of people give it credit for. And a lot of people on the internet will try to tell you that we can just fix ourselves through all these different things and that you can eat whatever you want. But the reality is the literature is suggesting that it's not so much about genetics, it's more about how you live your life and that you are in control of it at any possible age. I'll see you tomorrow.